I can't breathe. Three words that are indelibly etched in our minds and the conscience of America. I can't breathe. First time we hear those words, it's July 17th, 2014, when Eric Garner succumbs to death. And his alleged crime is for selling unregistered cigarettes. And I'm sure that that wasn't what the Surgeon General meant when he writes, cigarettes are dangerous to your health. I can't breathe. The next time we hear these words, I can't breathe, was just a few weeks ago on May 25th of 2020, George Floyd with a knee on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds as he's calling out for his mama, I can't breathe. And just the other day, we we're now hearing reports of on March the 3rd, 2020, Manuel Ellis, 33-year-old African-American man from Tacoma, Washington, died after being handcuffed and restrained by police. And and what is heard over the police scanner, his last words, I can't breathe. And the tragedy of it all is that when these three utters these words, I can't breathe, it's at the hands of those who've taken an oath to protect and serve. I can't breathe. And the tragedy again is that this is just three of hundreds and thousands that we will never know about. And of those who are oppressed on a daily and regular basis, I can't breathe. And this time, for whatever reason, it seems to have caught the attention of all America. And all America is saying, I can't breathe. Enough is enough. And when I reflect on those words, I can't breathe. I can't breathe when black men and black women are killed at the hands of those who are sworn to protect and serve. I can't breathe when black men and brown people receive longer jail sentences than their white counterparts for the identical crimes, but much longer sentences. I can't breathe when I see the future Prison beds are forecasted based upon the number of African American boys in the third grade. I can't breathe when I see that abortion clinics are strategically planted in urban centers near black and brown populations. I can't breathe when the percent of all abortions in America is the highest in the African American community, with only 13% of the population. I can't breathe. When I see musical artists and rappers and hip-hop artists defame black women, calling them every B and H word in the book, and I don't mean in the green stamp book. I can't breathe when I see Hollywood's depiction of black men and black women and the worst of stereotypes of roles that are broadcast around the world. I can't breathe when I see black folk that are regulated to substandard housing and communities that are in food 
food deserts where junk food joints are all over the place. I can't breathe when there are major disputes with access to health care and health biasness toward black men and brown men and black women and brown women. I can't breathe when COVID-19 spotlights that African Americans die at an extremely high rate of two to three times more than the percent they are of the population. I can't breathe when black folks sell their vote for a photo op and empty promises that never materialize. I can't breathe when racism has been resuscitated and unashamedly given a new life in America as if they've been drinking Red Bull. I can't breathe when I see uh, people judge African Americans not by the color of their skin, but also by the style of their hair. I can't breathe when George Floyd is murdered before our eyes, and not only can I breathe and no one will come to his aid because of the sacred blue line. I can't breathe when there there's no longer a thumb on the scale, but there's a knee on the neck. I can't breathe, and I'm a law and order kind of guy, but I can't breathe when I hear some shout the rule of law as if it only applies to those who are suppressed and hurting. Where was the cry for the rule of law with Trayvon and Eric and Ahmad and Brianna and George and thousands of others who are harassed on a daily basis. I can't breathe. And the truth is that all of America should be gasping for breath in this season because none of us can breathe. It's one of us can't breathe. Mm. I can't breathe. But how do we go forward? How do we go on? When I look at our text today, we can learn from the psalmist in Psalm 77. He's going through a battle. He's going through something. And we can learn from him that in the seasons that we have that where we can't breathe, we can learn from the psalmist how to grasp those seasons when we can't breathe. I want you to think about the thought today, I can't breathe. Let me look at verses 1, 2, and 3. In verse 1 of Psalm 77, we see these words, I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. Verse 2, in the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying, my soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. Selah. And Selah is a word that means to pause, to reflect upon what we just read. And the psalmist is telling us that he remembers to seek the Lord. In those seasons that we have where it seems that the world around us and events, let us remember to seek the Lord. The, the psalmist, again in verse 1, he encourages us. He says, I cry aloud to God, knowing that, that God will hear his cries. God will hear his prayers. And so he unashamedly and boldly goes to the Lord with all his sorrows, with all his hardships, with all his pain. He goes to God, the only help that he knows. And we can be confident that in our times when this world takes our breath away, we can go to God and lay out all of our situations of life before the Lord. We can cry unto the Lord. You know, sometimes this world will make you say, ouch. Now, even though the psalmist tells us in verse 2, that, that he goes to God with all his troubles. He's seeking the Lord and, and night and day. And, and so God is open 24-7. So whether it's the midnight hour or the noonday sun in the middle of the sky, we can go to God at any time. God is always available. Because sometimes your deacon, your preacher, your friend may not be available. But God is always waiting to hear from you. God is always available. Yes, he is. And some of you are in some seasons right now that 
You might find yourself crying and tearing up at times. There's nothing wrong with that. But seek the Lord in those seasons. And we've got a lot of stuff going around. The virus is spreading. The economy is shut down for a while, just starting to come back. Schools are shut down. People's work are shut down. Sports are shut down. Racial tension in America seems to be growing and ever increasing. And, and again, we need to go to God with our situations of life and cry out before the Lord, God will hear us. God obligates himself to hear our prayers. Yes, he does. And he says, when I remember God, I moan. And when I meditate, my spirit faints. That there are times when, when our spirits just can't go any farther, but God has us in his hands. And we can remember that even when we don't hear from God, that God hears us. Yes, that's the promises. This, this, this psalmist is like the old deacon that says, Father, I stretch my hand to you. Know the help I know. And the psalmist says, I stretch my hand to God. My friends, when you're going through in those breathless moments of this world, remember to seek the Lord in prayer. Remember to seek the Lord. When I was a small boy, when life hurt with his ups and downs, his little boo-boos, I could run to mom and dad. Well, mom and dad are no longer with me, but now I can run to God, amen, because they taught me how to run to God when life hurts. And my friends, life will hurt every now and then. Life will take your breath away every now and then. You'll have those I can't breathe moments every now and then. But don't run away from God. Run to God. He's our only help in this season with all your issues and frustrations. My friends, I want to encourage you, go to God. Run to God. Don't ever run away from God. Run to God. Amen. Again, God is available for us and even when we can't shout in our prayers and, and to be loud in our prayers, remember that God hears the faintest cry. Yes, he does. Just press your way out to the Lord. Amen. God will hear the faintest cry. Yes, he will. Now, sometimes God will not answer us right away. And that's what verse 3 gets into God will not always answer us right away. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. He's not hearing from God at the moment. But we can be encouraged that, to know that when we pursue God in prayer, God hears our prayer, but God may not always answer our prayers when we think God ought to be answering our prayers. Mm. But remember to seek the Lord. And those of you who have some life mileage on you, you know that God may not come when you want him, but we've learned over time that God is always, yes, he is, on time. Oh, I wish I could break out in a song right now because I'd say he's an on-time God. Yes, he is. May not come when you want him, but he's right on time. He's right on time. He's right on time. That's words to live by. Amen? Amen. Because we can know that God is an on-time God. Amen? And I know if you were here in the sanctuary this morning, you'd be giving people high fives and running up and down and just giving God praise, but he He's an on-time God, amen. Yes, he is. Don't let anybody tell you anything different, amen. Our job is to seek the Lord in prayer. And God will answer when he feels, when he, according to his plan and his will, it's time. But God is not ignoring your prayers because God's got a plan, God's got a purpose. Even we, what we think is delay is not denial. God hears our prayer. Our job is to remember to seek the Lord in those breathless moments of life. Mm. Don't ignore God, but run to God and meditate on his word, amen? So the point is, no matter how awful the moment might feel, no matter how bad things might look, no matter how disturbing things are right now, don't forget to seek the Lord in prayer. Yes, it shows your faithfulness and your trust in the Lord. 
Because we're going to have some seasons, and I've had some seasons, and you'll have some seasons and times, and even right now, mm, that we've got to seek the Lord in prayer. It's always a good time to pray, amen? We take all of our situations, and even if we've got to pray the same prayer over and over and over, that's not a lack of faith. And actually, it is faith in the Lord God, because knowing that God hears our prayers and sometimes it even helps us to process our hurts when we give the, that prayer to God over and over and over because we're taking it to the Lord in prayer. Now, don't, don't be like my wife. Years ago, my wife was praying about a certain situation, and she put a note on the refrigerator for all of us to see. And a few weeks went by, and I said, uh, honey, uh, why is that prayer still up there? Didn't God answer that prayer? She said, yeah. I said, well, why is it still up there? She said, well, I didn't like the answer. I want God to change his mind. Amen? Amen. Sometimes God will answer us, and we won't like God's answer. Amen. But my friends, part of when God does answer a prayer, our job is to be obedient. Because sometimes, sometimes God will answer our prayers like, hey, I want you to love your enemy. Don't hate your enemy. Love the enemy. Pray for your enemy. And it's hard sometimes to love your enemy. It's hard sometimes to pray for your enemy, amen, unless you're praying an imprecatory psalm, amen, which is a cursing psalm. But no, God says, I want you to love and pray for your enemy, amen, because it's easy. It's easy to love somebody that loves you. It's easy to love somebody that loves you. It's easy to love someone who's a friend, but can you love an enemy? Now, I don't have any enemies, I've got some confused friends. I've got some frenemies, amen? But God tells us to pray and to love our enemies, amen? Because it's easy to write your enemies off, amen? But when we go for God in prayer, sometimes we may, we may not like God's answer. But be obedient to God's direction. Because mm. God won't tell you anything that's contrary to his word, amen, amen. And just think about, th think about this. When Jesus is suspended between heaven and earth, what's he call out in prayer? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And if Jesus can forgive, how much more should you and I forgive? Mm. And think about this. When we look at the life of Jesus in the Gospels, Jesus is always found stealing away to pray. Stealing away to pray. So if the Son of the living God in his earthly ministry is always stealing away to pray, how much more you and I ought to have a robust prayer life, amen? You want to make it through the season. It's not about taking an Excedrin and an Alka-Salsa, but, but take a couple of prayer times, amen, and pray and pray and pray. My friends, we ought not be strangers with prayer. And the enemy wants to keep you away from praying. I want to encourage you, have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all your troubles, amen. Someone has said, oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to the Lord in prayer. And especially when life takes your breath away that you can't breathe, go to God in prayer. First, go to God in prayer Matter of fact, we see that Jesus in Hebrews 5, 7, we see these words. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. There were times that even this world took Jesus' breath away. But he goes to God the Father in prayer with loud cries and through tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. We go to God with respect, with reverence, with humility. Knowing that God is and that God is able to answer our prayers and he hears all of our prayers. So my friends, again, I want to encourage you to go to God, to seek the Lord first in prayer. And then the psalmist writes in verses 4 through 9, you hold my eyelids open, I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old, the years long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. 
Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are the promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Selah. Again, to reflect and meditate on what was just written. And in that passage of scripture, verses four through nine, The psalmist has gone before God and it's as if God is not answering his prayer, as if God's not hearing his prayer, as if God has gone mute. But my friends, here's the point. Remember, there may be times or seasons when God is silent. Now, it does not mean that God has not heard your prayer. God hears our prayer. But again, there are times when God may be silent in answering our prayer. That he may not be ready to move, amen? Amen. See, it's God is the potter, we are the clay. Because if we were God, sometimes we would be like the microwave and answer right away. But there are times that God may be silent, Mm, that God may not give an answer right away. Now, that's not the time to quit on God or to say that God's not existent or that that God doesn't care or that God's impotent or God God doesn't want anything to happen or God wants evil to flourish. No! That's a laugh in the pit of hell. And even the seasons that we're in now when we can't breathe and maybe it seems like God is silent, remember there may be times when God is silent. But it does not mean that God is not aware. It does not mean that God is up to something behind the scenes. Yes, he is. Mm. Yes, he is. God has prepared his course of life, his plan, and his program. And he just wants us to be faithful as we seek him in prayer, that even the times when he it seems like he is silent, that we remain praying and remain faithful to God. Now, it's in those times that we don't want to act like when the time in Exodus 32, when Moses goes up to have a conference with God, and the people down below, they go to Moses' brother Aaron and say, Aaron, hey, uh, Moses has been away a long time. He's been silent a long time. Aaron, we're going to collect all this gold. We want you to fashion for us a golden calf, our own God. And see, if we aren't careful, when God is silent, in those times that God is silent, if we aren't careful, we will make an image of God for ourselves. We'll get up and do what we want to do. We'll, We'll close up the Bible. We'll close off God's word to us and think we'll do what's right in our own eyes. Amen? But in those times when God is silent, because remember, his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are higher than all thoughts, amen, because he is God. Let us stay focused on the Lord, and if we do anything, let us do it consistent with the word of God, amen. So we will always be pleasing to God in our actions, amen. Mm, Because remember, we just said he's an on-time God. May not come when we want him, may not answer when we want him to answer, or the way we want him to answer, but he is God, and we come under his sovereignty and his authority that we want to God. Because I've heard people say things like, in those seasons when God is silent, I've heard people say things like, oh, God must be angry with me. That's why he's not answering me. And they feel that it's a license to go and do what they want to do. But my friends, God is not angry with you. God loves you. Now, God may not always, always like your behavior, but God wants you to follow him. There's a thing in the military called commander's intent so that when, when you're out on assignment and maybe communication breaks down, that you know the commander's intent so you can make decisions and follow through because you understand the commander's intent. So God is our commander in chief, amen? And we can know the intent of God by knowing the word of God, amen? And the more we know the word of God, the more we know our commander in chief's intent. So in those seasons when God is silent, when God's hit the mute button, not that God's not always aware, amen, because he's omnipresent, amen, but we can follow 
God's intent because we've studied the word of God, amen? And we don't get out there and make things worse. Remember, there are times when God may be silence. And even those times when we can't breathe, it might seem like God is silent. But remember that, that even when God is silent and we're going through hardships and can't breathe moments, that God is still with us. That God's using it to grow us, to maturity, to strengthen us. And that we run to God and it deepens our faith and trust and hope in God. Job goes through a lot of turmoil and the life issues of him takes his breath away. But he doesn't stop trusting in God. No matter what his friends would say. My friends, I want to encourage you. Do not stop trusting in God. And in those times when it seems like God is silent, that God is overdue in answering your prayer, don't run away from God. Don't turn your back on God. But drill down even more in your faith. Drill down more in the word of God and trust him. Act like you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember in 1964 when mom and dad went to what I think was their only vacation away from their six kids, just the two of them. They went to the 1964 World's Fair where before dad and mom left, dad lined all six of us up by age and I'm next to the end. And he looked at all of us, he said, your mother and I are going to the World's Fair in New York City, but we're coming back and I want good reports. And sure enough, he came back and praise be to God, he got good reports on all of us, amen? And see, my friends, even when God is silent, God still wants to hear good reports. Even when we can't breathe, God still wants good reports from us, amen? So let's march to God's drums, not our own drums, not the world's drums, not the devil's drum, but we're marching to God's drum, even when I can't breathe. And those scenes when God is silent, let us honor God. In verses, in verses 10 through 20, as we move to conclusion, the psalmist in verse 10, and matter of fact, we're not going to read all 10 verses 10 through 20. When, uh, at home this week, read the rest of those verses. I actually read the whole psalm and get some understanding as well. But for, for this sermon purposes, we're just going to do a couple of verses, at least Psalm 10 and 11. Because what happens, Psalm 10, here's what the psalmist says, then I, then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. And verse 11 reads, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. And see, verse 10, one writer says, that's a pivot point. Because in verses four through nine, the psalmist is kind of down in the doldrums, thinking that, well, God has abandoned me. God's not hearing me. God's not going to answer. God's not giving me any favor, more, any more grace. But then he, he remembers, he, he makes a pivot, you know, like in basketball. You, some, someone's guarding you and you're trying to score and you've got the ball and you're dribbling and you make a pivot one way. You're trying to psych out the person guarding you to get them off base. So he's going this way in the doldrums, but then he pivots and goes another way. He turns and, and the psalmist makes a pivot back back to God, back to the truth of God, back to the understanding, the history he has with God. He says, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. And see, he uses the right, the picture of the right hand. That's where the blessings of God come from, the, the, the blessings of God, the, the power of God, the favor of God, the right hand of God, amen. And the Most High God, El Elyon, the Most High, there's nobody better than God, nobody greater than God. He's the God of gods, the King of kings, the President of presidents, the Lord of lords, the Governor of governors. He's the one, amen. And so the psalm said, I'm going to turn to God because he's greater than anybody. And I've got history with God. So he's appealing to the history. And then verse 11, it reads, I will remember the deeds. Again, he's going to remember what God has done for him in the past and his people. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. And see, my friends, that's why sometimes we need to keep diaries. And here, here's the point I want to raise, raise up to you. So remember what God has done for you 
in the past. Remember what God has done for your family in the past. Remember what God has done for your people in the past. Remember what God has done for your nation in the past. Amen? And, and so, so the psalmist is telling us, I'm going to look back and remember what God has done for me in the past. Not that I deserve God's blessing. Not that I deserve God's protection. Not that I merit anything from God. But God has chosen to be with us and protect us. Mm, and so, my friends, I want to encourage you that we all think about and look back over the past, and we need to also share with our children and our young adults, because you haven't always been where you are right now. Mm, things already hasn't been as easy as they've been in the past, amen? Because God, here's the truth now, here's the truth now, because God has brought us Oh, hear me now. God has brought us, like my grandmother would say, God has brought us a mighty, a mighty long way. Yes, he has. Yes, he has. God's been good to us, amen? And we've got to remember that God has brought us a mighty, a mighty long way. Remember what God has done for you in the past. And don't keep it to yourself, amen? Because when you tell your stories, Give your testimonies of what God has done for you, amen? The psalmist remembers what God has done for his people. Yes, he does. He goes back to, to Moses. See, see the, the children of Israel were down in the Egypt land for 400 years. They were enslaved, having to make bricks without straw. And they were harshly treated and oppressed and abused, enslaved. But, but they gathered together, and they, for years and years, they kept calling out to God. See, they remembered to call to God. And even though God had been silent for some 400 years, they kept on calling. And when God is silent in your life, don't quit calling on God. I remember when I was a little boy, when I had a pain, mama, 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 I would call on mama until mama showed up. And I want you to keep calling on God until God shows up and shows out in your life. And the Israelites, they called, even though they were down in bondage in Egypt, they called on God and called on God and called on God. My friends, keep calling on God. And then finally, God moved. He remembered them. Yes, he did. And he sends them a deliverer by the name of Moses. And Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, Pharaoh, God told me to tell you to let my people go. Yes, it is. And my friends, when we call out to God time and time again, God has shown up and showed out. Ain't that the truth, amen? Yes, we got to tell the stories of how God has shown up, amen? Because our power comes from God, not from Washington, not from Richmond, but our power comes from El Elyon, El Shaddai, Almighty God, Most High God, amen? Yes, it does, amen? And again, as grandmother would say, God has brought us a mighty, a mighty long way. And Moses, as he's bringing the Israelites out of Egypt land, he comes to the edge of the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army's behind him. The Red Sea before him, it took his breath away. He says, oh no. He calls out to God and God says, what's in your hand? Stretch out that staff, amen. And God parts the Red Sea. He makes a dry highway between the waters and the Israelites and Moses walk through as they're walking through on dry land. My friends, God will fight your enemies, amen? You just be faithful. And when you've done all that you can do, and even when, when your breath is taken away, I want to encourage you to call on God. And even when God seems like he's silent, keep calling on God, amen? Because God has done for you in the past. He will do for you in the future. And he's brought us a mighty, a mighty long way. I feel like preaching up here, amen? Praise God. I want to encourage you to, to go to God, whatever your situation in life might be. Go to God in prayer, amen. But tell your stories. Write them down. Broadcast them. It encourages people, and especially our young people, amen. When they see the things going around the world, the protests, Nothing wrong with protesting, but be peaceful protesting, amen? 
But we got to tell our stories. Remember what God has done for us in the past. Tell them what God has done for you. Tell them your stories, amen? Tell them how God is. Tell them had it not been for the Lord on your side, you wouldn't be where you're being now, amen? Tell them how God has opened doors for you. Tell them that God opened doors that other people didn't want to open for you. Tell them how God made a way out of no way. Tell them years ago you couldn't live in the neighborhood you're living in now. Mm. Tell them that you couldn't get the job that you had now. Tell them that years ago your foreparents couldn't have had the careers that some of you have now. See, God has brought us a mighty long way. This is not a net negative story, not a bad story. It's a positive story because God has had his hand on us, amen? And God has brought us a mighty long way. Tell them that you, some of your grandparents were not able to vote, but now you can vote. So don't throw away your vote, amen? Get out and rest and make sure you vote, amen? Tell them how far God has brought you in this land, amen? When you think about our ancestors, packed in the underbelly of ships like sardines. Mm, but he's brought us from the outhouse to the White House, amen? God has his hand on you, amen? God hasn't brought you this far to leave you, amen? Yes, he has. Tell them, don't give up on God. God's not giving up on you. Tell them that God's got his hand on you. Tell them that God has delivered you time and time again. Remind them that had it not been for the Lord on your side, where would you be? Tell them that God has made a way out of no way. Tell them that in those sleepless nights, you cried and cried, but God delivered you in the morning time. Tell them how you can trust in the Lord with your whole heart. Tell them how God has brought you a mighty, a mighty long way. And tell them when you think about the goodness of the Lord, your soul cries out, hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And God, in this troubling times in America, God is making America great. Let me say it again. God is making America great. He's got to shake some dross off, shake the old ways off. But God has got his hand on us. Amen. So if you march, march peacefully. Amen. If you vote, vote. Amen. Bring a friend to vote. But remember, a call on God. Trust in God. See, God has a way of disturbing the comfortable and comforting the disturbed. We run to God in times of trouble. We trust in God in times of trouble. We're going to stay with God. And even when God, the times that God allows that take our breath away, we keep trusting in the Lord. So don't quit. Don't give up on God. Remember to seek the Lord in prayer. Remember that there may be some times when God is silent. But remember what God has done for you in the past. That God has brought you a mighty, a mighty long way. Yes, he has. And my friends, the truth is that there's nobody greater. There's nobody greater than God. And true enough, God has not brought us this far to leave us. Don't cower, don't quit. And the beautiful thing is, is that in this season, what makes this season a little bit different from the past, many of our white brothers and sisters are on the front lines in multitudes with us. And that's why I say this is a move of God. And God is making America great. That only God can make us great. So keep your hand in God's hands, be faithful to God. Remember what God has done for you in the past, that he's brought you a mighty, a mighty, a mighty, a mighty long way. God bless you. God bless you. As my grandmother would say, keep on, keep it on. Amen.